scripture this morning will be coming from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. As he was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. It's so good to see you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, we want you to know how blessed we are with your presence and we're thankful that you are here and hope that you will come back and be with us uh, again. I would think that for a lot of us, one of the first prayers that we remember saying as a child was, God is great, God is good, thank you for this food. You know, we learn from a young age and such things as that, that God is good. In Psalm 100 and verse 5, the psalmist says, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and His faithfulness to all generations. Again, the psalmist in Psalm 33 and verse 5, He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Damon read just a moment ago that as that young man came to Jesus and said, Good teacher, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. God is good. God is good all the time. Is that true? What about the times of suffering? What about the times when we go through pain? Not only in the happy times is God good, but is He also good in the sad times of, of loss and grief? Sorrow, depression, is God good then? God is good all the time. In seeking to understand that God is good, I want us to consider five fundamental truths this morning. The first one, before the foundation of the world, God is good. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And chapter 6 of Romans and verse 23 tells us what the price for that is. That the wages of sin is death. But in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, we see there that before Jesus even made us, He knew what He was going to have to face for us. He knew the temptations, the hardships, the difficulties of this life, betrayal, the pain that was to come. And yet, knowing all of those things and being perfectly cognizant of what it was going to cost him, he made us anyway. He created this world that was very good there in the beginning. And then he set aside parts of his divine attributes as God and his power. He set that aside to come and to be a servant and to be a sacrifice for all mankind. Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 10 through 11 makes it clear that he made that plan before the foundation of the world to save us. He established the church. He planned it all. Why? Well, because Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 17 says that God is ready, or the word could be translated, God is eager to pardon. He wants to forgive us. He wants to forgive us our, of our sins that would ultimately cause us pain and destroy us eternally. God was good before he ever created this world. Second truth, 
And when a baby is born, God is good. Oh, we're so blessed here. The babies that we've had born just here in the last few weeks, Brooks and Adeline, they are precious, they are pure, and they are innocent. Now, they are precious, pure, and innocent like every other baby in those nurseries at those hospitals. They may be prettier, right, Aaron, than those other babies. But they're just the same as precious and pure and innocent. They're not born in sin, as some teach. God is, God is good. He does not charge that baby with the guilt of another, even the guilt of Adam. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, God says, The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment of his father's, the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Babies are pure, and they are innocent. A baby's not saved. A baby is safe 100%. They don't have any sin to be saved from. They are precious and they are pure in the eyes of God. Folks, God is good when babies are born. The third truth is when a person is seeking the truth, God is good. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, Apostle Paul says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. See, God made a plan. We talked about that just a moment ago. God made a plan, and he paid a terrible price in the death of Jesus Christ to make that plan have power for each of our lives. And now he providentially paves the way for people to know the truth. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Knock and it will be open to you. Seek, and you will find. See, if you want it, if you're searching for it, if you're knocking on the door for truth, I guarantee you the Father's going to make certain that you have the opportunity to hear it. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13, he says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9 tells us, For the eyes of the Lord are constantly looking for those who want Him. He's looking for you. And He's going to help you find Him if that's what you want. God is good for the honest heart of a truth seeker. God is good. He will providentially make a way for such people to hear His truth. About three years ago, preacher named Don Blackwell, a wonderful gospel preacher, preached for many years, done a lot of good things in the Lord's kingdom. He was in a four-wheeler accident with his wife and will never walk again. He'd become a paraplegic on, on that day as he crushed his spine. But he talks about as he was living in a hotel, he was having to live in a hotel because, you know, your house, most of our houses are not necessarily handicap ready. And a lot of things had to be changed in his house. So him and his wife, after he had gotten out of rehab, were having to live in a hotel and wait for the house to get done. But you know what? There were four men, four contractors working on his house. And in the time that they were there, Don taught the gospel to all four of those men. And he brought them to Jesus Christ. Just recently, one of those men brought his own daughter to Christ as well. You know, even though Don faced a terrible and a hard situation, God took that situation and he brought truth seekers to him and enabled him to be able to teach them and to show him, too, that he still had great purpose even without the ability to walk. God took that situation and used that to open up the truth to these men. We see so narrowly in our lives. I, I, I see right here, I see the very second that I'm living, and I don't see anything beyond that. I see the, the handful of people that are around me in my life, and I don't even see their lives in totality. We see so narrowly, but God sees the whole big picture of things, a picture of the whole of humanity, and God is good in that respect when a person is seeking the truth. He brings things from all kinds of directions 
to make certain that that truth can have an impact on that person's life. The fourth truth is to the Christian who is trying to live right. God is so good. You know, we think about a person. A person comes forward and they, 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 they've studied the Bible and they, they obey the gospel and they are baptized into Christ and they are forgiven and born again there in those waters of baptism and they are saved as they come up having those sins removed from their lives that separated them from God. And we oftentimes will line up along this wall right here as they come out that door so that we can all give them hugs, right? Welcome them into the family of God, a a new brother, a new sister in Christ. And that person is so relieved, so relieved to have their sins forgiven by God. Then something happens to a lot of new Christians. You know, they... They have a very spiritually sensitive heart. That's what led them to obey to begin with. But that heart is still there and it's so sensitive and it's so spiritually minded that they begin to worry that, and think that they're not good enough. They, they see that they still have flaws in their lives. They see that they're still struggling with things in their life and they're bothered by this. And, and it begins to wear upon them. And the relief that they felt on that day that they came to Christ uh, seems to fade And it begins to be replaced by fear. It begins to be replaced by apprehension. And the Bible assures us that God is good, though. He wants us to go to heaven. You know, I think some come to believe that they're saved and lost many times a day. You know, they're, they're going along and they... They think something they shouldn't think, and they, they, you know, I think sometimes in our minds we think God yells down and goes, take him out of the book of life. And then we repent and we confess that sin and put him back in. And that happens many, many times a day, but yet that's not what the Scriptures say. We're not lost and saved over and over in a given day. Salvation for such people becomes dependent on luck of the draw, hoping that you, you don't die in one of those moments where you've been taken out. Hopefully you live till you get put back in kind of idea. And that's a, that's a very stressful way to live the Christian life. Folks, God is good. First John chapter 1 and verse 7, he says, For if you walk in the light as he himself, that being Jesus Christ, is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continuously cleanses you of all sin. In chapter 4 and verse 16 of the same book, John says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This extreme and eternal love of God should provide to each and every one of us comfort and confidence. We know and trust in its abiding power. We need to understand this in our lives. Christianity is not some failed system that does not take into account the extreme difficulty that comes with living this life for God. Thousands of years of preparation by God, I promise you, He took that into account. God coming to this earth, Jesus being crucified upon the cross, establishing the church, writing the Old Testament and the New Testament, I can promise you with all that God did, He made a plan for the difficulty of righteous living. And he put that plan in place for us. We're not talking once saved, always saved. You know what John said there in verse 7, if you walk in the light. There is a condition put to that. If I'm trying to do that which God wants me to do, I'm trying to live the very best that I can, I can promise you that even in those moments, there will be times when I will fail. And there is a difference, and a distinctive biblical difference between a mistake and a purposeful rejection in life of Jesus Christ and His will. We need to always understand that that separation between those two things. God is good, and He understands that about us as He perfectly sees our hearts. He knows whether I'm doing my very best to live for Him, and I've made a mistake in comparison to I have chosen to do what I want to do, and I don't care what God says. There's two very different things right there. 
Because of this truth, you can have confidence concerning the judgment day. Back again in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. Folks, we're not living a guessing game here. We need to know where we are. And we can know through God's Word and through walking in that light with Jesus Christ where we are. God is good to the Christian trying to live righteously. I think up to this point, might not, there might not be any real argument from people. You know, you can do a YouTube search for God is good all the time, and you'll find that there's songs out there, right? There's songs out there with those very words, and people sing those things. Uh, the religious world in general will, you know, believes that. We see that in those songs that are out there. You can go to Bucky's. Never have quite figured out why people get so excited about a service station. But you can go to Bucky's, and they sell a shirt at Bucky's that says God is good all the time. People, people believe it. They say that all the time. When a baby is born, God is good. When we get a new job, you know, it's something we maybe we've always wanted. We say, God is good. When our loved one beats cancer, God is good. When we come out of surgery successful, God is good. When we survive a heart attack, God is good. We say those things all the time. What if your loved one doesn't survive? Is God still good? What if your house burns down? Is God still good? What if you're diagnosed with a degenerative and incurable disease? Is God still good? What if you wake up from surgery and the doctor is waiting there for you to tell you that you will be a paraplegic the rest of your life like that minister I mentioned a few moments ago? Is God still good? It is those times when people question God. And in fact... Some people have become atheists and they have become agnostic because of their inability to reconcile those situations in their lives with the idea of God's goodness. The argument by these individuals is that with so much evil in a world, how can God be good? They reason it this way. The biblical God is loving. The biblical God is holy. The biblical God is wise. The biblical God is good. The biblical God is all-powerful. Yet, massive evil, they would say, still exists in this world. Therefore, the biblical God, in the face of massive evil, the biblical God cannot exist. That's the argument that they will make. There was an interview on YouTube of the British actor Stephen Fry, who is an agnostic. And the, viewer, the interviewer asked him this question. He says, suppose you're wrong. <laughs> suppose you're wrong and you die and one day and you walk up to the pearly gates and there's the God that you deny exists. And you're confronted by him. What will you say? This man's answer was, bone cancer and children? What about that? How dare you? How dare you create a world with such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly evil. And why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God which creates a world that is so full of injustice and pain? He said, that's what I would say. Now I would say that Mr. Fry is an extreme case. But you get the idea. You hear the mindset in an extreme degree. Judges chapter 6 and verse 13, we see Gideon wrestling with the same questions, wrestling with the same issue of things were not going well. There, there, there was a lot of misery in Israel during that time. And, and he asked, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening? So we see Gideon there, a Bible character we all know well, asking the very same kind of question, trying to reconcile these things. There are people 
who suffer from debilitating diseases and injuries who honestly and rightfully ask themselves this question. How can I go on like this? It is hard to fathom at times when we are in such deep difficulty. Even Job, a man of such great patience and faith, and yet there were times in that book when you listen to him, he's despairing. It's all that he's lost and all that he's gone through. I remember my niece, Whitney, dying of childhood leukemia at a very young age. Such a sweet girl whose life was cut excruciatingly short. In difficult times in my life, I've had to remember to remind myself how blessed I am. There are parents like my aunt and my uncle who have had to endure that kind of pain. I have not, and I'm thankful that I haven't. And I mourn for those that do. But we need to keep that stuff in perspective sometimes. How do we reconcile all this? Is God good even at heart-crushing moments like that? I want to suggest to you several words to help us find our way through this, to help us reconcile this in our hearts. And the first word is purpose. Why am I here? I believe that we frequently forget why we're here. We think that we exist to be happy and to be comfortable. Our biggest objectives sometimes are to have a nice car, a nice house, money in the bank, take nice vacations to relax and enjoy time with our friends, to go camping, to go hunting, to go fishing. And after all that, you know, that's what the world says is good. And so we kind of fall into that rut of that being our purpose. But you know what? Pain and suffering is incompatible with that idea. Why am I here? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. We talked about Ecclesiastes this morning in class, but Solomon says, Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole of man. And I'm going to say something that some will think is radical. And I heard someone say this, and I had to spend some time, and I spent some time thinking about it and come to understand that what they said was absolutely the truth. God cares more about your holiness than He does about your happiness. And you need to understand that. Consider the scriptures. Jeremiah, he was the weeping prophet. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus is prophesied as a man of sorrows and as a suffering servant. Luke chapter 22, in verses 41 through 44, it says Jesus is there in Gethsemane, and it says he and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying... Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. Now an angel of heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Mark chapter 14 and verse 39 then tells us, And he went away and prayed, saying the same words again. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 44 says that he left a third time and went away and prayed again these things. Hebrews looks back to this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane in Hebrews chapter 5 and and verse 7 says, In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who is able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Strong crying, wailing, sweat like blood. There is a a stress level there that is intonated in these statements. Jesus was miserable. As miserable as any human being can be or has been. And the most important thing to him at that moment was not his happiness. It was not his comfort. It was his will be done. The Father's will be done. And it was your and my salvation. That was the most important thing Hebrews 12 tells us. Folks, that's why we're here. 
so that the Father's will may be done. There was a Christian sister who, after a very serious car wreck, wrote the following words. She said, We're here to prepare ourselves for life after death. It doesn't really matter if we live 50 years or 100 years. Neither does it matter whether those years are carefree or filled with sorrow. The only consideration of lasting importance is where will I spend eternity. The second word, first word perfect, second word is perspective. I don't have a hundred foot of, or a thousand feet of rope, so I've got about four feet of rope here. But imagine this rope being a thousand feet long. Imagine this rope reaching all the way uh, to 110, just a very long piece of rope. If we took just this small little piece right here, eighth of an inch piece on the very end on one little strand of this rope, and, and we looked at that and we realized that's my life. That's all there is. My time on this earth is this very small piece and the rest of the rope for as far as it goes. And really my rope's not long enough because it would need to have no end. Is eternity. There's a perspective there. A perspective as to what is really important in this life. And you know, if I, if I lived for a hundred years, I haven't moved off that eighth of an inch. I'm still there. And there's still this vast amount that stretches out beyond that moment. Beyond, far beyond my time of breathing on this physical world. It's going to go far out there. My life is a vapor, as James says, that appears for a moment, and then it's gone. It vanishes away. Paul knew in his life, as we think about suffering, as we think about pain and difficult, the Apostle Paul knew pain and difficulty, folks. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23, he says, In far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and the day I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and dangers from robbers. Dangers from my countrymen, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, and cold and exposure. Paul knew pain and suffering in his life. In that same book, if you back up to chapter 4, in verse 7 he says, For momentary light affliction producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. comparison. See, there's the perspective, isn't it? You read chapter 11 and, and you see all, that, all those things that he suffered and then what does Paul call it? What's his perspective on all that suffering? It was momentary. It's momentary. It's, it's light in comparison to to what God has in store for me. I'll, I'll take it for what comes after. I'll endure it for the eternal life that Jesus Christ offers. Our third word is providence. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, still in 2 Corinthians, Paul prays three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed, and, and God's answer was no. And in verse 9, it says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient to you for power, my power is perfected in weakness. And then Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Romans chapter 8, maybe one of the most abused verses in all of Scripture in verse 28 it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Folks, that verse does not teach that God is the cause of everything. That verse does not teach that everything is good. It teaches providence. That God can take any situation, good or bad, 
and he can use it to help his people. We see this in Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 9, they, they, they come up on a blind man, and, and they, the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, neither. But let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to take that bad situation that's happened to this man just due to the natural things of life. I'm going to take this situation, and it's not a good situation, and I'm going to use it to show the glory of God. And he heals that blind man. And he shows the glory of God in that situation that happened in that man's life. We think about Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 and the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus did not have a comfortable and easy life. For the last 2,000 years, though, God has taken Lazarus and the suffering that he went through in this life, being carried every day to the rich man's gate and laid down, and the dogs would come and lick his sores. He had a, a miserable life as we would see it. And yet God has made him an example of faithfulness in dire circumstances for us all. What do you think? Would Lazarus tell you that all his misery in life was worth it? Where he's at now? Comforted in Abraham's bosom? I think so. I think absolutely so. He went through a brief time of suffering, and now he's in an eternity of comfort, able to teach countless numbers of, the, of people the value of faithfulness through the providence of God. Our fourth word this morning is profitable. Not all pain is bad. Some pain is... It's good for us. We need it. I, I broke my ankle one time, and I'm glad that I knew that it was broken by the pain, right? Because if you just keep walking on it, that bone just is going to start tearing stuff up. And, and bigger bones in other locations, you can do some real damage to your body. Pain sometimes is something that helps us see change, needed change. Sometimes it helps us see things that are hurting in our lives. I, I had a good friend who was an elder who had what's called silent angina. Which meant he would have a heart attack and he'd never feel anything. And one day he finally did, just drop dead from it. Never felt it, never warned, because there was no pain accompanying it to tell him to call 911 so that he could be saved by a doctor. So we see that the pain is sometimes needed. Psalm 119 and 71, the, the psalmist says, It is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 11 says, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son He receives. In verse 11 He says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. There wasn't a single spanking I got growing up that I enjoyed at that time. Oh, thank you, Dad, I enjoyed that. That was great. But I sure am glad my parents spanked me now. Because they taught me what was acceptable and unacceptable in those moments of discomfort. And that's what he's saying here in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 12. There is profit in our lives from suffering at times. Not enjoyable, but it's useful and we can learn from it. Our fifth word is presence. God's presence specifically. Even when I am enduring and suffering pain in this life, God is there for me. Listen to Paul in 2 Timothy just before he dies in chapter 4 and verses 16 and 17. He says, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. I, I love that. He said, Nobody would stick up for me. Nobody was with me. He's talking about Christians here. And he says, God, don't, don't hold that against them. <laughs> Listen to what else he says. But the Lord stood with me and strengthen me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. He said, man may have failed me, but God never does. God is always with me. Psalm 23 and 4, David says there, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, really the translation valley of deep darkness, he's not talking about death there, he's talking about these hard times in our lives and you want to you're going into this valley of deep darkness and the only reason why you're willing to do that is because you look at the shepherd. He's right there. He's leading the way. His, your rod and your staff, 
They comfort me because I know you'll take care of me in these dark places where the predators lie. So he's talking about life there. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God, God is good. And he's there. There's presence. Our sixth word is promise. I remember the promise. Revelation 21 and 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. Our pain, folks, it's only temporary. Our struggles are only temporary. I am an eternal being in a temporal body, a temporary body that is wearing out and I have the promise that I will go to heaven if I am faithful to God. Friends, family, God is good. God is good all the time, and that should keep us going. I told you five found fundamental truths. The fifth fundamental truth this morning for us to remember, God is good when his children die. Preacher got a call one night. He was services were over, and he was standing in the foyer, shaking hands and talking to people. And the church phone rang, and somebody answered. And they came out and they got him, and they said it's for you. And they said it's it's important. And so he went straight to the phone, and it was his wife. And she said, "You need to come. Dad's my dad's dying. His his father-in-law was was dying." So he immediately rushed from the church building and went to the nursing home. And he got there, and there was his wife and his sister-in-law, and and the the hospice nurse there with his father-in-law in the bed. And his father-in-law was struggling, very erratic breathing, very hard breathing. He was just really having a hard time, and they said he's been, he's been like that. He's been doing that now for hours, been struggling like that. Just every breath, just a, a major effort, just a heave every time he was trying to breathe. And, and the nurse took him aside and said that sometimes a person... They need to be told. They need to be told that they can let go. That people will hold on because they don't want to let go for some particular reason and they'll just keep forcing themselves to stay. And the preacher, as he thought about what that nurse was telling him, he, he thought, I bet he was hanging on if that's what was going on in his mind as he was thinking about it. So that his two girls wouldn't be alone when he passed from this life. So she told him, she said, you need to go over to him and you need to tell him he can let go. He said, that helps. So he said he walked over and he went up to the bedside and he put his hand on him. He said, Frank, you can let go. Frank, Frank was a gospel preacher for years. Faithful, hard worker. He said, go to the Lord. Go to Jane. His wife had died of ALS about six months earlier. Go to Jane. After he said those words, he died within seconds. Everything smoothed out. And he left his life. Going back to Lazarus, Luke 16, 22. It says that Lazarus died and angels, angels, carried him to Abraham's bosom. God is good. If you, do, if you look at surveys, almost every survey that takes with the people take that asks them what is your greatest fear Almost always the majority of people say it's death. And so on the day that we face the thing that is most frightening to us in this life, for the Christian, 
Angels stand there. Angels wait to tell us to be not afraid and to take us to a place of comfort and rest. God is good. And God is good all the time. Even in our suffering, in our good times, and even in the moment when we leave this life, God is good. If today you need to become a Christian, God is good. It may be that the providence of God that has brought you to this moment today is because you're a truth seeker. You are at this place in life to have this opportunity to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's what you need to do, don't walk away from that. Don't walk away from the goodness of God. Respond to that goodness believing in Jesus Christ. Repenting of the life that would take you away from God and turning to walk in a direction that brings you to Him. Confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and therefore He has the power to raise you from the dead one day and to take you to heaven. Be buried in baptism, coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ there in that watery burial and rising, as Romans 6 says, to walk a new life, having been born again, as Jesus said in John 3, there in that water. To have your sins washed away, to become that child of God, and to know all the rest of your days how good God is. And even more so, in the day that you breathe your last, and those angels take you to know for all eternity, God is so good. Maybe you're a Christian this morning. Maybe your confidence hasn't been what it should be. Maybe you haven't been living as you should in some particular way. God is so good. He wants you to come back. He wants you to renew your life. He wants you to put yourself on that right path, to walk in that light where the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing you of your sins. If you've gotten out of that, if you've moved away from that, come back today. If we can help you, if we can assist you, we want to because we all serve a God that is so very good. We don't want to keep him to ourselves. He doesn't want us to keep him to himself, but he wants us to give everybody the chance to know him. I hope that you will obey him today as we stand as we stand. Rise up and build in the name of